Welcome to Dracina Wines Podcast. Our wines plus your moments equals great memories. I'm your host, Lori, and this is a podcast about all things wine. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of Dracina Wines Podcast. Before we get into the podcast, I want to thank a few people who took the time out to leave us a review. First up is titled Great Content by Joey Price HR. I've always wanted to become smarter about wine, and this podcast will help. I enjoyed the Great Wines of Italy episode and look forward to future podcasts. Next up, the podcast to get smart on wine by JustinBaileySpeaks.com. I just learned more from this podcast about wine than I ever have in my life. Lori gives a behind-the-scenes look on how these grapes make a great glass. The only thing missing is a taste. And lastly, we have Wining Down with Elizabeth Kush. All you need to know about what makes great wine, the vineyards, the vines, the trellises, and the soil. I've been to the vineyard but didn't know the details about why you need great vines to make great wines. I'll definitely tune in again to learn more about what makes great wine because I love good wine. So thanks, guys, for taking the time to share. I appreciate if anybody else who's listening to this can follow their lead and scroll down on your device right now and leave us a review. It honestly is the best way to help us get our podcast out in front of people. Now, on to the episode. Join me and my wine writing friends, Jeff Kralik, aka The Drunken Cyclist, Debbie Giaquindo, HV Wine Goddess, Nick Barube, Winecom Guy, Martin Redman of Enophiles, and Tina More of Wine Studio as we discuss our thoughts on wine tasting etiquette. Slancha. Hey, we are live. Yeah. So, right. hey everybody. Hello. Hey. hey, thanks for joining on your Monday evening. So, this is actually our second episode of the Wine Writers Wrap-Up, um, but as an introduction to who is here, first I have uh, Tina. She is the owner of Wine Studio, a wine education and grassroots marketing program that provides a platform where wine writers, industry, and consumers taste and discuss highlighted brands. Wine Studio's message is interactive wine education, thus a better understanding for the world through wine and our part in that world. So hi, Tina. Hi, hi guys. And next, Debbie is the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess. She's a certified wine specialist and wine location specialist in Port and Champagne and has a background in travel, radio marketing, and community relations. She is also the author of Tapping the Hudson Valley, chairperson of the Hudson Valley Wine and Spirits Competition, and co-owner of Happy Bitch Wines, and my co-host on Wine for Bet Street which is a free monthly wine education program. Next up is Nick. He is the marketing and brand manager for two wineries in the Pacific Northwest. He began his career in wine down in Argentina, where he did marketing communications for a well-known Malbec producer. He holds his advanced certificate in wine and spirits from the Wine and Spirit Education Trust and is currently a WSET diploma student. And next is Martin. He is a finance executive who caught the wine bug later in life than most, but he dived into the Venus pool of knowledge headfirst and started Enofly's wine blog in 2010. He is also the founder of the Pacific Point Wine Tasting Club and has written for the American Winery Guide and is currently a contributor to the Visit Lodi blog. And Jeff is an award-winning wine writer and blogger based in Houston, Texas. His appreciation for wine started while studying in Strasbourg, France, and blossomed as a high school teacher when he would spend his summers as a bicycle tour guide in Europe. Jeff has visited, often by bike, most of the wine-growing regions of Europe and the U.S. According to Jeff, I am a storyteller. While I take my writing seriously, I try not to take myself that seriously. So welcome. Hey, what's and that last guy, he sounds he sounds kind of like a loser. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. Yeah. And lastly, I'm Lori, your host, 
My husband, Michael, and I own a boutique winery in Paso Robles. We specialize in producing award-winning Cabernet Franc. We are the founders of Cab Franc Day. In addition to my microbiology background, I am a graduate of UC Davis' winemaking program. I write an award-winning blog, produce a podcast, co-host Wife of Bed Street with Debbie. So welcome, everybody. How are we doing tonight? Great. 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 What? Oh, we lost Tina. Most important question. What's everybody drinking tonight? I got an arrogant frog on. There we go. Arrogant frog rosé. Very nice. Rosé of Syrah. A barrel sample from Pedincelli Winery. Their uh, 2016 Dry Creek Zinfandel from Poloni Vineyard. Nice little screw cap. Very, uh, very retro. Very nice, very nice. Always good to have barrel samples. I'm drinking a uh, single vineyard Pinot Noir, I'm sorry, yeah, Pinot Noir Rosé from uh, New Zealand. Good stuff. Very nice. Yeah. I'm drinking a Rosé of Sangiovese and Tempranillo from Witt Cellars in Crosser, Washington. Awesome. And I'm drinking beer. <laughs> I'm going with Goose Island 312 Wheat Ale. It felt like a beer night to me. But anyway. Well, it seems like it's rosé all day with everybody except for uh, you and I. Uh, there, uh, yeah, I know. I, I like hearing rosé all day. You know, rosé, Cab Franc, those are the two things I like to hear. You know. In tonight's episode, we are talking about wine etiquette. Okay? And I think this is pretty much a hot topic because... We've all been in tasting rooms where something has probably annoyed the living daylights out of us. And some of us might be more uh, out, outspoken than others to say, <laughs> what the eck are you doing? Um, but so I just want to go over like some certain, you know, first of all, do you think it matters if the tasting, if you're at a free tasting or a charge tasting? Do you think it matters of how people act? Absolutely. I do. Yeah. And, and this is just from things that I've seen. When you're paying $35, $40 for a tasting, you know, you're getting a little bit more than just standing at the bar, you know, having the pours for you and, and the person explaining it to you. I think it's less people are are more serious they take it a little bit more seriously when you're putting a little bit more money down on it and you're getting a little bit you know more you're getting a little you know, you're getting value for it than if you're standing and you're paying five dollars for a tasting and you're tasting six wines and then you want to go back and revisit one and then you walk out buzzed yeah i tend to agree with that if it's a uh, what i call a low barrier of entry then people tend to do uh I think be uh, less well behaved. Yeah, I, I kind of equate it to, um, you know, if you walk to, if you're in a casino and you're playing at a blackjack table, that's $5. It's, it's the people who are there don't really know how to play blackjack and uh, make it kind of tough on the people who do know how to play blackjack. Um, so I do, I do think that there's a different level of uh, decorum, I guess. Um, but I don't think you have people who are paying $40, Debbie, for a tasting that are there to get drunk, for the right, most part. they're not. And, right. I, and I think that's the separation sometimes. Yeah, but, but I don't know. I mean, um, coming from an education background where I taught in private schools for years, people who pay seem to think that that entitles them in some way. Oh. Um, and, so, and so... I, I, I haven't been in too many paid tastings, but I can imagine the case where, well, I paid my 40 bucks. I'll do whatever the heck I want to. Um, and so I, I don't know if it's, it's, it's as uh, uh, cut and dry as, as just a certain number or a certain amount paid will guarantee or ensure a, quote, good tasting, whatever that might be. Right. Well, and I think a lot of it is also geographic. Um, you know, maybe Napa Sonoma, you're paying that 34, 35 upwards, you know, $50. 
Whereas they're smaller, you know, even in the Willamette Valley, you can go to a really nice tasting room and the tasting fee is, you know, five to ten dollars. And you would expect, you know, a certain level of decorum, you know, at that type of winery. I don't, I don't even, I'm trying to rack my head to think if there's even a winery in Paso that's a $40 tasting. So I think that, uh, I mean, How about that? That's, that was the one that was just going to pop yeah, in. I think yeah. they're 30. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think they're well, 30. Well, going along with what Nick says, I've been um, to Long Island a few times and Perhaps that should be set aside because that's a different. Yeah, that's completely different. You're not getting a, a forty, you know, whatever. Say a thirty dollar Long Island tasting and a thirty dollar Napa tasting. You're getting two different things. Right. No, I, I totally agree. But paying for a tasting on a Long Island does not ensure any kind of decorum. Whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> five dollars on Long Island, thirty-five dollars on Long Island. There's no difference. Right. Yeah. I mean, and we'll, I guess we'll get into that, uh, the uh, the bridal limo showing up, <laughs> each plopping down 50 bucks at a tasting in Long Island, and it gets out of control really quickly there. But that's yeah. another topic that I think is on the docket tonight. Yes, and uh, in Long Island, in Long Island, every every other word is uh, F this. This effing wine is so effing amazing. F this. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that. I've, Long Island is the only place that that word is used as a noun, an adjective, a verb. <laughs> oh, oh. So, Martin, what do you think? Uh, do you, do you yeah, have, no, I, I think it's. Uh, I think it depends. Uh, as I said earlier, I think anytime you have a low barrier of entry, I think once you combine that, I think that demographics also plays a role. You know, if you've got a low barrier of entry. And you're talking about somebody who's 25, um, they may have a very different way of looking at things than somebody who has a low barrier of entry and is, you know, 45 or 50. So, you know, you look at demographics, you look at um, someone who has invested and put some money into it, and I think that you've got, uh, you're going to get a little bit more decorum with someone who may be more mature, typically, um, and uh, has paid a little bit of money for it. But, you know, there's always exceptions. Right. I think people are you generally generally speaking, I think people, you know, wine tasting is a great activity, it's fun, and people will just go out, they don't really uh, know what the rules are or don't give a damn about what the rules are because I think there's too many rules in wine anyway. They just go and if your objective is to get buzz and drink as much as you can, I don't know if that changes if you are paying thirty five dollars or paying five bucks. Right. And I think that goes back to what Jeff was saying is if that's their goal, now they just paid thirty-five dollars. They're gonna want their thirty-five dollars worth of right. of wine. They're not they're not gonna be happy with the you know two ounce pour here and you know listening to somebody tell them the history of a winery. Yeah, no doubt. Well, I think that's the main factor here is are people going to wine taste or are they going to wine drink? And I think currently that there's no line there. It's very very much a gray, you know, gray area. Yeah, agreed. I also think the, the the day of the week plays a huge role. If you're going on a Saturday or a Sunday, it's going to be a very different experience than on a Wednesday. Um, generally speaking, I mean, that, that might be a broad brush to, to paint, but uh, uh, the weekends are definitely, from what I've heard, especially, I, I think Martin uh, has been up to Dry Creek quite a bit. He can attest oh, yeah. to... Uh, Dry Creek on the weekends is a lot different than Dry Creek, Dry Creek on a Monday afternoon. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, yeah, and that, that shows true with just how there's many tasting rooms who aren't even open on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You know, there's several tasting rooms that are only Thursday through Sunday because that's when the majority of people show up. Has anybody ever been in a tasting room that somebody – refused to pour because they were out of control or drunk or just downright obnoxious? Does that include me? Well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, I can tell you that I, that I have. My experience was uh, several years ago I went to uh, barrel tasting. Uh, Jeff, Jeff made a reference to Dry Creek Valley. It was a barrel tasting weekend in Dry Creek Valley. 
and there was a uh, uh, younger woman who uh, went to uh, one of the tasting rooms there. Uh, they refused to serve her. She was then, she left the tasting room and started to go across the street and literally with a face plant drunk in the middle of the street. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And so that, that's what got me thinking about this whole barrier of entry, you know, barrel tasting weekend. Hey, come up, do some barrel tasting. It's only five bucks. It's only 10 bucks. So the person who's going to be attracted to that, um, is going to be, uh, it might get more people who are interested in, um, you know, wine drinking rather than wine tasting. Yeah. I, I think that that's a, a big thing because, um, just from our aspect of it and, Nick, you've probably seen the same thing when you we've when we first started having the winery and going to pouring events. We were like, all right, let's get here. Let's get our name out. We'll go behind the table. We'll pour our wine for people to taste. And the very first event we did was by sheer luck was like a hundred dollars a ticket. Right. So we poured. We made sales. We didn't go through a lot of wine, but we made sales. And everybody was very pleasant. It was a great experience. The next one we did by sheer horrible luck was turned out to be $30 that then had a Groupon for 50% off. So it was $15 for this tasting event. And we were like pouring wine over and people just were coming back and they're like, give us another glass. Give us another, you know, it wasn't, they weren't tasting. They were getting drunk because it was an afternoon of wine for $15 if they Groupon it. Um, yeah. so we now, before we agree to do an event, um, we look to see what the price is of the tickets and see if they, you know, all right, we're not going to really group on this or whatever, or we're doing it for another reason. Like we're doing the Chaffee zoo next month because it's for the zoo, Got it. you know? Um, but I think that that's a, that's definitely true. $5 for barrel tasting is like. That's just asking for people to have a party. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that if uh, Groupon is involved with the wine tasting, uh, no good can come of this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's going out on a limb. I, I full out agree with you. Full yeah, out you're, agree. On, you're on terra firma there. You're yeah. on terra firma. <laughs> First topic, children in the tasting room. Been there, done that, like it, Been don't there, like it, that. varies what? I, I have to tell you, I'm going to tell you a story, because I was the parent with the children in the tasting room, and my kids were probably seven and nine at the time. We were down in Virginia, and we were at Colonial Winery, and they had just opened. We pulled in, got out of the car, you know, went in, and we went to do a tour, and there was an older couple um, that were joining us on the tour, and if if you could read the looks on their face, they were like, what the F are these people doing with these kids? Why, why are they bringing these kids on this tour? So we took the tour. The guy, the guy was, you know, took us through everything. And at the end of the tour, he says, does anybody have any questions? So my son raises his hand and the guy says, you know, yes. And he says, how do you know when the grapes went to pick the grapes? Well, that was the icebreaker because then the guy's like, that's a really good question. The people were like, wow. And the guy, you know, went on about the sugar levels. So after the tour, we went into the tasting room and there was a table and my kids sat at the table with a deck of cards and we made friends with our new friends that now didn't hate us because we brought our kids to the tasting room. <laughs> but... You know, it, it can be a scientific um, education for the kids. But on the flip side, you have to have entertainment for the kids because these kids need to be entertained while you're tasting as well and not bothering you. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have to judge it on your kids. Should your kid, you know, I've seen a lot in the wineries where kids have, like, fallen into ponds because mom and dad are not watching the kids and it's not the people in the tasting room you know, job. watch the kids. And if your kids drown, it's not our fault because you're supposed to be watching your kid. So I've, I've seen both and I've been on each side. 
But I think, you know, as a parent, you know if you should bring your child to a winery or not. And I think that a parent should make a good judgment on that. All right, I'll agree with that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Debbie, especially the last part that you said, like uh, to bring some stuff for your kids to do. Um, I, I kind of, when I heard this topic, I thought of immediately about airplanes. Um, and with the exception of really small kids, I would question bringing really small kids to a wine and tasting. Um, so old enough to need attention, but young enough not to be able to provide their own entertainment. If you give them a game, we give them cards or something like that. So from, you know, one to whatever. On a plane, you have to travel. So I don't really, it doesn't upset me all that much because I've been there, I've done that. But a tasting room, if you're bringing a kid who's, who's predisposed to crying a lot or screaming or running around, that that's really, I think, Debbie, you were alluding to, that falls on the parent, that you have to make the good decisions. And then with the older kids, we always prepared our kids. This is what we're going to do. Look, we have, and I wrote about this a couple of times on my blog, not to plug my own blog, the drunkencyclist.com, but please visit. Um, <laughs> Of course, you would never do that, Jeff. No, I would never do that. That was just an example. Yeah, promotion of here. No, but but when we went to Sonoma once, we said, okay, we're going to go to this tasting room for an hour, two hours. After that, we're going to go to the uh, Charles Schultz Museum in downtown Santa Rosa or give them some other kind of um, carrot so that if they're good, we'll do this. Um, I think that you can't just – to me, it would be irresponsible to do – five, six hours straight of tasting with your kids in tow. That, that to me, and I don't want to, that would be, I would consider myself a bad parent. If I, I agree. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the uh, the airplane thing. I was, what, what that brought to mind for me was, uh, I've been to the movies <laughs> several times, and the parent has decided to bring a three-year-old to see, uh, you know, the Black Panther, and the kid's crying throughout the whole movie. I mean, you as a parent have to use some judgment. Uh, you know, if this is the same kid that you can't get through the checkout line without uh, the kid throwing a tantrum, that's not the kind of, you know, you know your child. Right. You got have you got to exercise some judgment there. I think it's doable. I've seen plenty of well-behaved kids in tasting rooms. I said the parents will usually bring uh, a card game or something like that, uh, piggybacking on what Jeff said. If you give them uh, an incentive for later and you're sharing uh, your day with them, and I think that uh, is a, a great incentive to make them say, okay, you know, it's just an hour or whatever. It's cool. Um, may I say something? Hi, Absolutely. <laughs> Tina. Sorry. I had some technical difficulties in the beginning, but I think it all depends on the culture of the winery. Honestly, there are a lot of winemakers who are very young. They're just starting out, and they have small children. Some of them... Are there at the winery at the tastings? Some, of course, are not. It all depends on on, on the winemakers, and if their kids are there, then that means they're going to allow other children there. Always, though, um, like you all have said, um, it's up to the parents to kind of police the kids. But that's with everything, right? So yeah. I don't I don't particularly care if kids are there or not. But as Martin said too, it, it, you really have to police your children. And make sure they don't get into things because you know winery can be dangerous for children anything can be dangerous for children but yeah but i think it all comes down to the culture of the winery itself and the winemakers okay, i think there's certain wineries that could lend themselves more to bringing children um and others like dow i mean i would never bring i mean i don't have kids but that does not create an essence that is children friendly, you know, not saying that they aren't, I don't know, but I have never, ever seen a child in there because again, it's a, it's an upper echelon. I mean, it's like, would you see kids in Opus one? Uh, probably not. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So it depends. It depends on the culture of each winery, how, how they present themselves and that's how they agree to have children there or not. So I think it's cool that every particular winery has a different culture and they allow kids, they don't allow kids. I think that's the fun of it. Everything is different. 
why would you want to go to a winery where it's every it's always the same each each winery each you know it's that's boring and some allow you to move your puppies so you know some yep. are dog friendly yeah, yeah exactly that's same thing that's cool and i might also add some are bike friendly some are not yeah see <laughs> Those damn bicyclists, you know? I tell you, man. Get home. <laughs> those bicyclists think they are. Yeah. They're a scourge on the planet. Yeah. <laughs> so I will, I will share, because I personally am a believer of that I don't care what age the child is, and it's the parents. It's full out the parents. It's And for me, you know, the same thing with dogs. If the dog is going to, it's not the pit bull that's bad. It's the... It's the owner of the pit bull that has allowed him to do whatever. Okay. Um, but I, so if your children are social, socially adept at being okay at a winery, then bring them to the winery. Um, and it's not a bad thing to introduce them to something like that. Cause it can become an educational experience for them. Um, and if, like you were saying, Jeff, if, you know, it's the kid who, or Martin, if it's the kid who is throwing a temper tantrum in the middle of the grocery store, then it's probably not the child that should be sitting there at a tasting room. But um, I was, you know, in Bordeaux, we were doing the uh, on premieres uh, tasting, the silent auction, and I turn around and there's this woman with a baby, like baby, baby, right? Attached here. Right. So she's sipping the wine and she's spitting. And every time she's spitting, the baby's head is coming like within inches of the spit bucket thing. And the splash is going all over her baby's head. I, <laughs> I, I, I lost it. <laughs> I lost it. I'm like, oh, my God, I can't I can't believe like like this is happening, you know, I mean, and honestly, the baby was perfectly fine. It wasn't crying. It wasn't doing anything, but she's bending over. The head is coming close. It's the spit is going all over. I'm like, okay, that's inappropriate. I'm sorry. I think that's it. <laughs> well, see, Lori, I think you touched on the problem there in that it sounds like at least cursory uh, surveying of the people on this chat that we're all somewhat in agreement that the parents are somewhat responsible, if not totally responsible in deciding if and when their kids can attend them on a tasting. But the problem is that there are a lot of parents out there that don't have that self-awareness. Correct. And yeah. so my question would be to, to the rest of the people here tonight, what do you do, as Lori just uh, mentioned uh, at the, the premiere tasting in Bordeaux, what do you do when you're on a tasting? And sorry, my phone just went like berserk. It's someone calling for a political donation, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> What do you do when you're in that tasting and there's a kid, that, there's a parent there, there's kids there that are going berserk and distracting you from what you want to do? And I, I don't think any of us would say, you know, well, I wouldn't certainly say, you know, the kid's got to go or, but it is distracting. It is something that takes you away from what you're there intending to do. How, how do you react to that? What, what, what's a good, uh, uh, scorecard or what's a good playbook to, to handle that? How would you do that? That's a great yeah, question. I think almost if you're at a, in a tasty room and the child's acting out and it's a group of, of people and not everyone can enjoy it, maybe it, it would be up to the employee to say, I'm sorry, sir, but can you take your child out and calm him him or her down and bring it back? Bring it back. <laughs> Or bring it. <laughs> you're not, not going to make me that one. <laughs> bring him or her back when 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 the kid shuts up. But no. But you know, I have you know my patience run thin. But when and now that I'm older, sometimes I don't have a filter anymore. So if it's really wearing on me, I might just turn around and say something. But I, I think in a, in a tasting, perhaps. It should come from an employee. I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think the third party is always a good a good tactic. Um, although, you know, if, if you are there and you are um, being bothered by it, I think it's okay to, to say, hey, um, you know, don't mean to bother you. Have you considered, you know, I don't think you want to necessarily come directly at a person. 
but uh, more so to do it in a in, in, with a little diplomacy. You know, hey, I see your child is upset. Is there anything I can do to help? You know, something along those lines. No, I mean, because that to me that that's a legitimate question because there are a few things you can criticize people about, right? One of them certainly is the way they raise their child. That is something that is really difficult line to cross. Yeah, I'll roll my eyes until I almost pass out because they're going so far up into my forehead that I can't barely breathe. But beyond that, can you say control your child? I mean, you can't. I mean, what do you teach them at home? You can't say you. That's a line that's really difficult to cross, yeah. right? Debbie brought up, or I'm sorry, it was uh, Lori that brought up the, the the child who was attached to to the, the chest of a woman, and part of me thought, well, maybe she's training them. I'm not not. <laughs> I mean, but this kid's getting used to tastings, and maybe this is going to be a kid later on that's going to be that's going to handle it well. I mean, we brought we took our kids to tastings. I mean, Spit Bucket wasn't as as, as closely involved as, as Lori described, um, but we brought them, you know, in the car seat, put them off in the corner, and if they started to the voice up, either my wife or I would take them out. And out, but that was a self awareness that going going to what you're saying, Jeff. I think that that situation it's usually. If they're a conscientious parent, they're aware that their child is doing something and they're the ones who would pick them up, take them outside or do something like that. The children, in, in what I see, children who are running amok and doing whatever, the parents are in their own world for most of the time and they're not doing anything anyway. So you saying something to them is only going to cause... Um, an argument because they don't see that they're doing anything wrong and they don't see that their child is they're perfect. Right. That's why I like the third party thing where someone in the, in the tasting room or the winery is um, hopefully uh, been yeah. in a situation and is going to, uh, you know, politely uh, address it. Right. I agree with you, Martin. I think that if people are being distracted, you talk to your winery host or wine educator, you know, let them know, that this is distracting you, and then it's up to the winery staff to, you know, speak to those parents. You know, whether you're saying there's you know, dangerous things that they could, you know, with the glassware or, you know, ponds. Uh, we have a pond, and so, uh, yeah, I, I would never go up to a parent. I'm not a parent, so I'm not going to go tell somebody how to do that, but as a winery staff, Absolutely, we would go and say that they are being a nuisance. Take them to the car. Take them to the car. <laughs> Lock them in the car. Them Let them in there with Lock them in the car. Roll up the windows. It's only it's only eighty five today. Don't be <laughs> <laughs> no problem whatsoever. <laughs> uh, so there's a probably not where you say uh, you ain't got to go home, but you got to get the hell out of here. There you go. Exactly. Exactly. Right, right, right. All right. So, Jeff, this is uh, one of your uh, hot hot spots or hot topics. Go ahead. Let's hear the perfume. Oh, oh my God. It yeah. just, it, it, so I didn't realize until I started getting to this point that I have a pretty sensitive nose. I mean, it's big enough that it should be pretty sensitive. Um, <laughs> but, um, I was saying before we started that uh, I, I do this rosé tasting every year. This will be the second year, so I can call it now every year. And um, a neighbor who lives literally two doors down, uh, she agreed to do the blind pouring, and I was all excited because that meant that I didn't have to do it. Um, but she came wearing so much perfume that I, I invited a few other wine writers here in Houston to do the tasting with me, and I, I was embarrassed that it was just... It was so heavy, and it's kind of like that thing with the kids. It's like, when do you say, um, uh, well, you know what? You kind of overdid it there on the uh, Jordash the uh, uh, perfume there. Um, Jordash so, <laughs> perfume. I haven't even heard of that. <laughs> it was big back in I'm pretty sure there was a Jordache perfume. There had to have been. There was too. You guys, you guys may not be as old as me, but you've read about it. I mean, it's, it's in a history yeah. book. Um, so, so to me, that that's and so the, the, the rosé tasting is coming up again. And although they moved away, they're going to be back for it. 
And I'm trying to find a diplomatic way to say, oh, by the way, could you not bathe in the stuff before you come over? Yeah, ver it's very easy. You just say, this is yeah. a new painting and you can't wear any perfume. Yeah. yeah, is there an invitation? Or, yeah. Online? Just announce it to everybody yeah. so it's not just one person. Yeah. Or one person. Well, or at least say yeah. you're sending it to everybody and just send it to her. <laughs> yeah, no, I will say, I um, I did the Boston Wine Expo with my Happy Bitch Wines, and I was staying with my girlfriend, and her daughter was helping us, or helping us, helping me pour. And I said to my girlfriend, I said, Sharon, Ju and I said to Julie, I said, if you were, don't wear perfume, because it'll interfere with the tasting. And Julie's like, oh, okay, good to know, because I was just going to put some on. But, I, I mean, I think you need to say, no perfume. And the same thing goes with uh, cologne and aftershave or whatever you guys, whatever you men do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever you guys do. <laughs> You know? Slap on that aftershave before. <laughs> but with the guys, you might want a little something to uh, mask the funk. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if they're riding those bikes in, you know. Exactly. Wow, here we go. That was just breath in the wine. That was not sweat from the cyclist. <laughs> <laughs> Ever is looking to blame a tall cyclist. That's, that's the way it you know, it's funny because we had uh, we just did a, a wine tasting, and uh, my wife and I had this discussion about this very topic. Uh, we have a good friend; she's pretty wine savvy, uh, but she likes the uh, she likes the uh, the perfume. And uh, I said, "You, know, I'm going to talk to her. I, I love the idea of uh, you know when you send out the e bite or whatever, just put it in there, so you know it doesn't look like you're targeting anybody. Uh, but in this case, sort of a Facebook thing, and uh, we didn't put that in there." And, uh, you know, my wife was saying, you know, for somebody who, I mean, that's just who they are. They wear perfume. And if they had a choice between, you know, wearing perfume or not going, it probably wouldn't come. Um, and so I do like the idea of putting it on the invitation. Um, but <laughs> see the frown on just, again, directly saying, hey, don't wear any perfume. I don't know. I was, I was ready to, to chat with her about it. And, you know, again, kind of taking the diplomatic route and saying, hey, um, you know, if you're wearing perfume, it can get in the way uh, of, you know, other people picking up aromas and flavors. Because people just don't know. I don't think they think about it. Right. It's a, so I think what it, happens if somebody still still comes to a tasting and still has perfume? And they still got the email. So what do you do? Send it to the car. <laughs> Send it to the car with the kids. <laughs> the child route. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I find another place to go taste, but um, I just I, I literally go away from that person to do what I'm gonna do. If I'm yeah. you know, tasting right. the wine. I'm just going to find another place to taste it, and sniff it, and do all that. Exactly. Now, see, I think I'm just gonna have a, a spray bottle full of water and just dab it. Actually, it'll make it work. <laughs> no, but I think Tina brings up a good point. If, you, if you're in a tasting room and we're, if we're talking about something yeah. else, I mean, this happened in my house, so my inability to voice my concerns with her aside, this is something that relatively I could control. But if you're in a tasting room and you go and we were talking about cost, if you plop down 50 bucks and the woman next to you is wearing, or the man next to you is wearing way too much cologne, oof. I mean, I just spent fifty dollars on a tasting, and all I can smell is, you know, the sweet, sweet violet of, you know, whatever perfume it is. Uh, no, what really gets me, and we have, I mean, if we're going to talk about specific scents, is patchouli, which is I, I, oh, I, that's I repulsive. That. And so, you know, I've been, in a, I've been in a wine, in a winery when someone comes in with patchouli on, and I just, you can't smell, I can't smell anything else, yeah. and. You know, what do you say at that point? If you plop down 20, 30, 40, 50 bucks for a tasting, which I wouldn't do, but that's a different topic. Um, that you is a tough You know what? Coming again from the winery side, if somebody came in and you know, their scent was so overpowering that, you know, people wouldn't 
you know, move or they're in a seated tasting, if those people came and told us later that they couldn't enjoy their experience, we would absolutely refund them or invite them back. So, you know, I just say be honest with your winery host and, you know, if it's a good winery, they'll understand that you were there for that experience, you didn't receive it, and then they will do what they can. Right, but it's not always, I mean, that's wonderful customer service, and I agree that that's what you should do as the winery, but that's still, if those people, let's say they came and that was the one day they were in the winery, right, this was what they were looking forward to, and it was ruined, it's really not your fault as the winery, right, I mean, you're you're stepping up and, and saying we apologize for that, but they're their event has been ruined, you know, their experience has been ruined. Um, but then again, the winery can't do anything if they're not told about it beforehand, right? I mean, but as a winery, you, you want them to, to come back. Right. You know, so you want to make it, okay, yeah, they, they had a lousy time because the person well, had um, way too much cologne, but please give us another chance. Right. I, I agree. I completely agree that that's what the winery is doing. But for that individual, um, that may be the only shot they got to, to do that's that. That's true experience. because they might be on vacation. And right. Think they're not coming back. Right. And it's nothing against the winery. I mean, they'll go home and they'll write a great right. trip advisor review for you, the winery for the customer service, you know, and, you know, call out the, the perfume person. But, it's still, it's sad because other people's actions are interfering with the experience yeah. of somebody else, you know. Yeah, unfortunately, that's life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. Yeah, yeah you have no control guilty. over anybody else, right. even winery. Right, Nick? You have no control over that. You just try and make the right. best situation you can. That's it. Yeah. And, you know, there's a difference between addressing screaming or running around child versus how somebody smells. Yes. yes. I will say, like, in my book, I actually did put, like, clean etiquette, and one of the things I did list in there is not to wear perfume, cologne, and even lipstick or chapstick, because that, that can interfere with the whole entire tasting experience. <laughs> I mean, that's a funny point you just brought up. I was just at a, a blending seminar at Rodney Strong, and it's a long story, but I'll make it short. Two people on the on the blending seminar, it was for media, so they would to promote this blending seminar. And they were social uh, uh, influencers. And so we each made a blend, and then the winemaker was to judge who was the winner. And he said, oh, my gosh, this one's really interesting. There's some pineapple and coconut on the blend and he was taking it out of the glass that they had used that they had used and it was her lip gloss that he was picking up in the <laughs> oh my gosh wow yeah. and so it was luckily they didn't win because if they would have won i would have lost the gas the <laughs> well, then you would have to go out and buy that lip gloss well, she had, she, her, her boyfriend made the lip gloss, so we each got a little tube of the lip gloss. Oh. Um, so, yeah, so that was a little, little little added little perk there to that weekend that I didn't anticipate. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and people, you know, people don't realize. They yeah. don't realize what they put on affects the entire experience. Not just their experience, but also the people around them's experience. Right. But as you Tina know, said, that's I, life. Because there's a lot of people who go through this world that yeah. don't pay attention don't. to how they affect anybody else in the world. Yeah, they don't give a hoot. Okay. Well, I, I have a work friend. A lot of them are French. <laughs> <laughs> I love the French. I speak French. My kids go to a French school, but the French people are completely oblivious to everybody else. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. I hope, Lori, that the demographic of people who watch this podcast aren't predominantly French. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, this is yours. Bachelorette parties. Oh, Woo -hoo. Who has been in a tasting room when a bachelorette party has come in? Run. Yep. 
Hands up. That was just in one. Yeah. Wow. Nick, I'm sorry, what winery do you work at? So I work for Duck Pond Cellars in Dundee, Oregon, and Desert Wind Winery in Prosser, Washington. So I do the marketing and brand management for them. Shameless plug, four and five. (laughs) So rarely in the tasting room, but when I see buses come in, if I'm at a winery and there's a bus coming in, you know, first thing I think of is, okay, good, they're at least being safe they're not drinking and driving because if you're on a bus you're most likely there to wine drink and not wine taste um but when you have a bachelorette party or bachelor party or whatever kind of group there tends to be just a lot of noise they're not again they're not you know they're not thinking about what other people are are doing and why they're there well you know there are oh go ahead they're they're not thinking about buying either i was just gonna no of course not no buses in general, um, and I was just at a winery doing the tasting, and the uh, the owner he was saying that you know he doesn't allow buses anymore because the buses would come in, they want kickbacks, um, you know they're not there to buy, they're just there to to drink, and you know he was mentioning that the last group that came in actually said, do you want to donate some bottles for our after party? What? Like, what? <laughs> like, if somebody said, "If you would you, would you like to donate for our after party?" No. no I would like to pay for those bottles for your after party. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Mm. Um, well, you so know, and there are wineries. So you might not have ahead. the answer to this, but then why do any wineries accept any parties like that? Mm-hmm. I mean, exactly. To me, that would no, be there's. Exactly. Yep. Um, because they're still getting a tasting fee. Um, and so there's those wineries that actually have that culture, that demographic that go. There's wine regions, um, one in particular in Southern California that I can think of, that really caters to, you know, that type of experience. You know, you, you're going to go in and, you know, you might have some wineries that do more private, intimate experiences, but it's like Disneyland for adults. I believe in San Diego that I went to school at, so you probably know uh, the wine region. Yeah, I know. Temecula. Temecula. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. It is what it is, you know? It is what it yeah. is. And people go there just for that, and that's fantastic. And and the more serious uh, tasters do not. So, it, you right. know, there's a place for everything. But sometimes wineries have um, special rooms. Yeah. For those groups. Yeah. But typically, what happens is these groups are set up ahead of time. Um, it's all paid for ahead of time, and they come in, and then the winery knows that they're coming in. Yeah. So, you know, right. the private event, they kind of put them in one area or whatever. And then there are wineries that just don't care. And right. everybody's in with the masses. You know, again, it, it all depends what, what you know, the wine Yeah, when we have groups, I mean, we work with tour companies um, all the time. And when we have groups coming in, we separate them and put them in a whole separate area. Um, just because we understand that that's, you know, the experience that they want versus what other people are going to be getting if they're in the tasting room. All right. How about tipping? Tipping your person, your wine educator, um, or might not be a wine educator, just somebody who's behind the counter. What's your thoughts on tipping? I've done it, especially if if a tasting has been comped. I I typically do it. But then again, I I come from industry, so it's just just kind of what you do. But it's not for everybody. You know, to me, it's it's very regional. When I went to uh, tasting down in Arizona, um, they are very obvious about it. They, it's like going to a restaurant where they will you know, say, here's the tasting fee, and there's a line there for uh, the tip. And they're starting to see more of that in, in California, and so I'm thinking that it's more of a, uh, a local thing. I don't know. So i, I got to ask a yeah. question here, though, with reflection on the tip. Now that I'm in the restaurant business also, so when you're tipping – 
are they getting paid less? And then they got to count on the tips to make up the difference in that salary. Now in the tasting rooms where, where you're, you're asked for tips or is there like a jar for tips? Yeah. I throw stuff in there, but when you check it out and you are asked to add a tip, you know what I'm, I'm kind of saying here? Yeah. yeah. So Debbie, um, there's not, so a lot of the, that tip line is the point of sale system. That's what I was um, going to say. We okay. had a lot of discussion, um, you know, with, within like the Willamette Valley and wineries here, um, on a Facebook group about, you know, all of a sudden our POS systems were, you know, putting in these tip lines. How did we feel about it? Um, you know, the wine industry notoriously pays low. You know, we, we work in wine because we love wine. We love educating people on wine. It's not that if there's a tip line, now they're going to make less like a server in a restaurant. You know, it's just kind of an added benefit now for, for that tasting room staff. I'm still kind of on the fence about it, you know, from a brand perspective, but I know that having happy tasting room staff is really important. And, you know, whether you're tipping or buying a bottle, you know, it's going to help that, that team. And I think if you have a really good experience, you should definitely tip. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, you're going to a tasty room and you have somebody that's, you know, really educating you and, you know, all of a sudden you feel like family. I mean, you know, I, I absolutely think so. Well, uh, and, I, and I agree with all that uh, from a wine consumer point of view, but from, I mean, I don't really know the, the, the background of, of the question because as a wine writer, back to Nick, Nick's comment, the only people that get paid less in the wine industry than the people working in a winery are probably the wine writers. So to tip for something that I'm going to spend several hours on writing about uh, doesn't make sense to me, but um, from a wine consumer point of view, again, if, if it's a fifty dollar tasting, mm, I, a tip on top of that that seems a little bit much. If it's you know a free tasting or somebody spends a lot of time with you and takes brings out some uh, special bottles from under the counter that not everybody gets because they know that you kind of get it and you will appreciate it. Then sure, I think that that's that's completely appropriate. Um, but as as Debbie was saying, it really depends on the situation for me. Uh, we typically do not tip. Um, we you know, and we we do buy a lot, so that's another way. Like Nick was saying, um, but we also, you know, I've been I've been tasting with friends. You know, and they, they were like, oh, no, we're obligated to buy. They, you know, they gave us this porn, you know, they gave us this taste. We were obligated to buy. And Mike and I don't agree with that either. I don't feel obligated to buy. If I walk into a winery and they give me a free tasting, I'm appreciative that it's a free tasting. But if I don't like the wine, I'm not buying the wine, you know. Um, and I, we don't tip normally. But if, like Jeff was saying, they went beyond what I consider the call of duty, then I, I do tip. So we were at Niner in Paso and we had Vegas with us. So we were sitting outside and this young kid who was behind the counter, he ran out to see us, then ran back and got a water bowl for Vegas on his own. We didn't ask for it. We were going to ask, but we didn't have to. So he got a, he got a water bowl for Vegas. He refilled the water bowl while we were tasting and he ran back and forth like four times to give us different tastings. And then we said something about one of the wines. He went back and grabbed like Jeff was saying an extra bottle because we liked this. He thought we would like that. So he opened it, a different bottle for us. And because we had Vegas, we were outside. So he was running back and forth. So I felt that that deserved a tip because he was exceptional. Unfortunately, um, I kind of tipped off of what we purchased. I just did because they did square. So I just kind of tipped 20%. And we bought, we bought like 
a case of wine. So <laughs> he was <Yeah>. really <laughs> he was really happy. Mike, not so happy, but <laughs> you know. Lori, the, the, the moral of that story is you must spit when you taste. Yeah. <laughs> And don't spit into the dog's bowl. Don't spit into the I just was like, yeah, tip, 20%. And I hit her, I signed it. And as I signed it, I was like, whoa. So I realized it. But, you know, what are you going to do after that? Say, oh, excuse me, I over-tipped you? You should be reward for good service. I really do. Yeah. So do you always tip then, Lori? Or... No, we typically do not tip. We typically do not tip. If if we walk in and they, and we also don't typically go through an entire tasting, you know, Mike and I, first of all, Mike and I always share. We never, we never take the two tastings, complimentary or not complimentary. We just always share. And then we always pick and choose, you know, two or three that we're interested in. I, you know, we never go through an entire lineup, you know, unless the person is like, you got to try this, you got to try this. Then we're just like, well, all right, we'll try. But, um, so we, we very rarely tip. Well, it's, I hope if you're sharing that you're not wearing lip gloss, then Lori. Only, only the coconut one. <laughs> yeah, I've never been to the wineries, but when I'm doing that a lot of here in California, where I don't think it's pretty, I don't think it's expected or typical. Um, and like I said, I've been uh, other places. Even when I was up in in Oregon uh, last summer, um, I got you know, and like you make a good point in terms of it may be the POS system, um, but I saw a lot more of the you know, sort of tip line uh, that I see here where you know, people are just saying, you know, the tasting is $35, give you a check for $35. Yeah, and, yeah it's people. interesting. So you're you're going to a winery, you're being provided a service, right? So that word right. service usually implies that you should be getting some sort of tip, correct? I mean, restaurants, you're tipping, yeah. you're, you're being provided a service. So why do we feel it's different in a winery? And I'm just throwing it out there. You know, yeah. I don't care either way. Just, why, why do we feel it's different? Well, I would say first, you don't know what the pay structure is at the individual winery. Um, I, I assume, Tina, um, traveling like you do, in Europe, it's a different tip schedule. It's a, right. it's a different thing. And so um, sometimes an extravagant, you know, exorbitant tip is seen as kind of almost rude or kind of... Uh, stupid American thinking that they're, you know, um, but I don't know. It's a great question. I mean, I, back to Martin's comment, I don't, I, I mean, I, I can conceive of seeing a tip jar at a tasting room, but it's not so often that I, that it's commonplace for me. Um, and so I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, and now in the position that many of us are now in, it's, it's not, we're not our, your average consumer going into a tasting room saying, what should I do here? Um, so uh, for, for advice for friends or for people watching this, what should they do? I mean, if there's a tip jar and you have a couple extra bucks, I mean, sure. I, I, but uh, I don't know if I feel, tell people they should feel obligated to do it. Because I don't know. I've been... I, I've been a waiter before. I know what the pay structure is there, and that most of my pay was was based on tips. So I, I know that. But at a tasting, I've never worked in a tasting room, and maybe Nick could chime in. Um, is it is it more expected because their their wages are so low? I, I don't know the answer to that. You know, to your to your question, Tina. I think some of it it just has to do with custom. If it's customary to tip, you know, which is it is in restaurant. I mean, I, I would t if, even if I have a horrible, unless I just have a nightmare experience in a restaurant, I still tip. I mean, not tip as much, but it's customary to tip in a restaurant. I think in wineries, it's not necessarily customary to tip. We may be doing it now, uh, but it hasn't always been the custom. So sure. some, some of it is just an awareness around, you know, things have changed, things have evolved. Um, you know, to, to your point, you know, if I go to uh, a grocery store and I get great service from someone who's right. packing my bags, I don't tip. It's not customary. So let's take it out of the actual tasting room. And now you've been given a wine and cheese pairing or, you know, like at Mandavi, you can go to, you know, um, they have that, the events, lots of wineries have the pairing 
where you're sitting down. Now somebody is actually serving you. See, I guess my, in my brain, pouring, you know, pouring a little wine and walking away and pouring a little wine for somebody else and walking back and whatever, I don't put that into my mind as the same type of service as at a restaurant. Whether that's right or wrong, I think that's where I'm seeing it. But now let's take it to where you're sitting down and you're physically being served. They're pouring you wine. They're talking about something. You're getting cheese or you're getting a food pairing. Does that change your opinion? But can I say you're paying for that? Uh, yeah. I mean, you're but you're paying, paying for a restaurant. You're for paying. That, and that person is coming around, is, is bringing you that, say, that cheese plate. Is also talking to you about the wine. Right. But so, well, you're, sure. you're sitting at a restaurant. You're paying for that steak. You're paying for that. So yeah. that's why I went there. No, I, I would come back to Martin's comment. Is, you know, what's customary? I, I was a bike tour guide in Europe for, for many years, and it was probably, I don't know, five years into it before I received my first tip, and I was kind of like, ooh. That's kind of fun, but not not expected. You know, people are paying. Um, uh, to Debbie's point, how much are you paying? And people are paying, you know, three, four, five thousand dollars a week to go on this trip. And and do I expect them to pay more because I changed the flat tire or I cleaned their bike? Well, no, but it was it was appreciated. And, and so, it, but it comes in that gray area that Martin was suggesting is that, gosh, what you know. We, we, I, mean, I think we've all experienced when we moved to our house in Houston, we're, we're Googling day and night trying to figure out, do we tip the movers? Do we tip the repair people? Do we, whom do we tip? Um, because we don't want to be that person that doesn't tip, um, but you know, money's not free, so we don't want to be the person that tips when someone says, oh, well, wow, they just give me 50 bucks, suckers. <laughs> um, so, uh, you, you know, I, I mean, I think Martin touched on it. At a restaurant, it's customary. I mean, that's accepted. You do it. And I'm with him. It, I, I can't remember the last time I gave less than 15%. Usually we do around 20. And if it's not, if it's terrible service, it's 15. Because I think this poor kid, he's he or she is working for, you know, $2 an hour. And, and I can't. Do it. But to get back to the tasting, I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. I, I, you know, if, if it's a private tasting and they do a lot of things, but I paid... 50 bucks for it, do, do, do they deserve something else? How much of that 50 bucks are they getting? I have no idea. I, I, I don't know. So it's a tough one for me. I, so I, if, I, I fail on this etiquette. Yeah. <laughs> so if we knew that, a ta and this goes for any service industry, if we knew that a tasting room employee, per se, this is what we're talking about, if we knew that a tasting room employee was getting $10 an hour, right? And they served us, and they served each of, us, each of us really well. Are we more inclined to give them a tip because we know that they're only getting ten dollars an hour? What if we knew that they were getting twenty-five dollars an hour? If they gave us the same service, would we tip them as well? Yeah. Good question. Good question. That's a great question. I mean, when I'm getting that kind of pay, I would be more inclined to tip them. But the whole—that's the whole point is you're trying to support people. You are, you are. Um, there's, there's an altruism behind tipping people who are not, who are making minimum wage, for example. Uh, California is uh, this whole concept around the livable wages. And so if someone is struggling with a livable wage in, in an area that costs a lot, uh, you actually feel good about tipping. At least I do. Um, but again, I, I don't have any visibility. I don't know whether people are getting uh, commissions on bottles that are sold. I have no idea. I don't know. But, but, well, Martin, I, I agree with you on, on one side. It, to me, the tip is for the service provided. Right. Right? So if you're getting $25 an hour and I'm getting $10 an hour, one might assume that you're providing better service. Mm. But if we're providing the same service, should our relative wage come into it? Either you're happy with the service or you're not. Right? And so it, it, to me, it, it, it's a multifaceted question because I agree with you that, that well, what, what you were suggesting, I don't know if this is your opinion, that a livable wage is something that I think everybody should get well, maybe, for an honest day's work. But maybe also there is a, um, a fine line where you go into a tasting and it says, 
you know, I don't want to say please don't tip, but, or tips appreciated. You know what I, you know what I mean? Where, I agree. yeah, and I think the honest, whether, where there, there's a, they can define whether, you know, somebody that's, that's giving you, you know, such a good time, so much information going above and beyond, and you want a tip, you're not sure are they being compensated. Um, so you'll know whether or not, okay, that $50 that you're paying for that tasting, are they getting part of it? Is that why they're putting on this show? Or are you paying $10 and they're putting on what they're putting on, you know, and giving you yeah. the good service in hopes of a tip? Right. So I, I think the onus should be placed upon the winery to communicate with their patrons um, how things are. You know, I've seen in wineries, oh, no need to tip, you know, our employees are well taken care of, or, you know, they, everybody does it differently. But I, I do think it, it, it does fall on the, the winery to communicate that plainly. So then, so then the so customers are not worried about it. Because you go in, you're like, should I tip? Should I not tip? Oh, my God, what do I do? That's that's not a good feeling. You're already, you're already you know, not, not feeling great about the experience, so... Um, but, so when you go in, you, you just you want the experience just to be fantastic. You don't have to worry about anything. And a lot of well, people Tina, worry about tipping. Well, Tina, I agree with you completely, but then there's the Uber model, right? And so Uber, as compared to Lyft, Uber was no tipping but I until recently. But then I've been in, in Uber cars where it says tips accepted. And then you say, well, wait a minute. Uber says no tipping, and now you have a sign that says tips accepted. What do I have to do now? I mean, right. you heard how much or how little. Way to deserve that tip. Right, and that's what I'm saying. So if they're just doing their job, then I don't. That's why. That's why that that the kid at Niner we tipped because I think he went beyond what his job was. I think. I think they're getting paid to pour wine and to educate if the person wants to be educated, because that's a whole other topic. Um, you know, but if they're going to go beyond, you know, for us, him filling up Vegas's water bowl twice, he would have gotten a tip no matter what, because that was him paying attention to what, what is important to us. You know, um, I don't think, just pouring deserves a tip. Um, but I get what Tina's saying is, you know, it is up to the winery to kind of let the people know, hey, it's, these are like waiters. They're not getting paid a lot or they're, you know, like, like Martin was saying, there's confusion of what they're getting paid, where when you walk into a restaurant, you know, those waiters are living right. off of tips. When you walk into a winery, every winery is so different that you don't know what the situation is. Well, and I would say, Lori, to to your point, I've never been, or if I if I did go to a winery and the tasting room staff, all they did was walk up, pour a wine, and walk away. I may not tip. I, I might, you know, buy a bottle if I liked one of the wines, but I've actually never really experienced that. I don't think most wineries, that's their, that's Thank the culture you. of a winery. So there should always be some level of interaction, interaction because they are in the, in, in the hospitality industry. Right. I was, I was Ultimately. kind of being facetious about it. Like just if that, mm -hmm. if they're just pouring and they're reiterating what's in, what they're taught to say right. versus giving a personalized experience Right. That's that's where I think that's where I think there's a difference, um, but well, well, that Laura, you bring up a good point because that was I, I don't know what, what our time situation is, but uh, one of my wine etiquette things is I go to a lot of tastings, and you get uh, tasting room staff that are on a script, right? That they say, and I, I see it as my personal job to get them off that script to say, you know. I, I, I don't. I don't care about the barrel. I don't care about you know the. What do you really like about the wine? I mean, I want to right, and, 
And so if they do that, then it's a more personalized tasting. And I, I feel more connected with the person that's giving that tasting. And I feel that they should be rewarded for that. But when they, they're, I'm sure we've all been in tastings like that. They, they will stick to the script no matter what. Right. And to me, that's maddening. I just want to say, you know what? I could have been anybody. You should tailor your spiel. You should tailor your script to the person in front of you. I might not know anything about wine, but I know Martin knows a ton about wine. So you should be able to tailor it to, to those two different types of people. Yeah, that's one of my pet peeves is you, you know, there's the same spiel no matter what. And, you know, there are, even because to your point, Jeff, I go into a tasting room, so I'm going to I'm gonna drop some terms. Or I'm going to try to let the server know <laughs> I'm not a newbie. Right. It doesn't matter. In some places, other places, they will pick up on that, and then they will tailor the experience to you. Other places, it doesn't, you know. Right. doesn't matter. Still turning the page. Yep. Right. So is that a reflection on the winery? I think it's a reflection on the training of their staff, yeah. It's a reflection on the training, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think also, I think there's sometimes that um tasting tasting room staff um with the script they don't get to taste and and I say this because I had an experience in Jersey and uh, <laughs> with um with with an oxidized wine and I said to the the kid you need to taste this. And he wouldn't taste the wine. And he asked me, he says, should I open another bottle? And I said, I think you should. So he did. And he had ne and he, yet he never tasted the wine. So I think everything that he said was scripted. So there was no deviation. Right. And he probably was told he's not allowed to drink on the job. And he wasn't allowed well, to drink wine. Right. Yeah, state laws will definitely, you know, determine that. Um, it just became law in Oregon that you can have now up to three ounces, I think, during your shift as you know, educational. Um, but we always, every day, our tasting room staff taste through the wines. Like, yeah. they spit. But there's, that's ridiculous. Unless there's some weird state law in New Jersey. Says you can't. I, no, it's just you know, New Jersey. I, I really don't know. Because, no, because the same thing the same thing happened at a at a winery in in California, a very well known winery. Um, we went in and both Mike and I tasted the wine and we're like, this is corked. This is not this is not right. And uh, the the guy behind the counter was like, it def he was arguing with us, you know, and. Uh, and, you know, we were just like, well, just open another bottle so we can taste, you know, he's, no, this is perfectly fine. And then the winemaker came out and Mike proceeded to tell this to the winemaker and the winemaker tasted and said, it's absolutely corked, you know, um, and then opened another one. So that, you know, I, I don't know what happened behind the scenes after we left with the winemaker and the person, but um, I think, Tina, it is a reflection on, on the winery, like the... Mm -hmm the winery needs to train their people appropriately to know the difference between good and bad and to interact with their, with their personnel. But that's what makes the difference between a good, uh, you know, a tasting experience and a good tasting experience. And yeah. I Nick, 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 I can assure you there are no weird state laws in New Jersey. <laughs> is, it, is it Bash Jersey Night? Did I miss something? <laughs> yeah. When is it not Bash Jersey Night? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> kind of true. Kind of true. Come on, I'm, I'm from Philly. That's what we do. I mean, come on. Those are my topics. Um, does anybody have any other topic that they feel they want to discuss? Or are we ready for the riddle of the night? Just to the riddle. Ooh, to the, the riddle. riddle. All right, here's my riddle of the night. Ready? Well, we need some type of music or something. Oh, oh there you go. Da, da, da. Yeah, I don't have anything near me to give music. And Elmo's too far away to make him giggle. Um, all right, ready? Here we go. If you have three, you have three. If you have two, you have two. If you have one, you have none. What am I? Ooh, 
we this is a bigger stumper than last month. If you have three, you oh. have three. If you have two, you have two. And if you have one, you have none. Correct. Zero. What am I? Do, uh, do, 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 I gotta get my kids done. Yeah, they were do, 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 do. Alone? I don't know. Alone. <laughs> Alone. Yeah, I'll, tell you, I'll just say it's zero. Yeah. A group? You, well, am I a group? Three, two. You are a choice. Choices. If you have three, you have three choices. If you have two, you have two choices. If you have one, you don't have any choice. Uh, all have a choice on what wine to drink. There you go. See? And see, I actually, I, I, I took a little, I thought Eccles would be here, so I was going to, you know, he always chooses his his uh, grape hop or pop or whatever to um, to who their guest is. This was about you have choices when you go into the tasting room of how you're going to act. And that's why it was choices. There you go. Robert? I guess Eccles had a choice whether he wanted to show up or not. I did. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bash him on social media later. Oh, he's, he's trash right now. <laughs> so this is the time where you have like one minute to wrap it up and give your own, uh, you know, selfish, pl selfish plugs of what's going on with you, what you want people to know, where to find you. So I'm just going to go left to right on my screen. Debbie. Oh, Debbie Giaquindo, Hudson Valley Wine Goddess .com. You can find me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. And uh, if you're in South Jersey, come visit me at um, our new restaurant, 1630, uh, Kitchen 330, 330, 96th Street in Stone Harbor. Awesome. Next. Jeff. Me? I'm next? Yeah. I'm not, I have a different lineup. Uh, Jeff Kralik on thedrunkencyclist.com, uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, nothing really exciting going on, except for I'm, I'm doing a blind tasting of true rosés, which are non-Senier rosés here in Houston in the month of May. So if you want to join in and you're around, uh, please join in. And if, even if you're not around, we have plenty of room. You can come down and I'll, we'll put you up for a weekend. Oh, well, nice. There's an offer. Everybody's coming to Hi. Jeff's house. <laughs> Martin. Ah, okay. Uh... I am uh, Martin Redmond. I write uh, Enophile's uh, wine blog. That's the uh, phonetic spelling of the Greek word, Enophile. And um, you can find me there for www.enophileswineblog.com or on social media, just Martin D. Redmond. Uh, not doing anything exciting this week. I did go uh, this past weekend to a uh, historic Vineyard Society tasting over in San Francisco. Huge fun. That's Great awesome. Place. Nice chatting with you all. Nick, nice to meet hey. you. Tina, you're Pleasure. up. Me. Oh, um, Tina Mori. Um, my company uh, is called Wine Studio. That's hashtag Wine Studio. It's on Twitter. It's a wine education and brand marketing. Um, let's see. What's my latest and greatest? Actually, we're going to be posting, um, I think, most of you know Ethan Joseph from Iapetus Wine in Vermont. He's going to be on the program in May. Um, really cool wine coming out of Vermont. Really tiny micro winery. So if you're online, check out Wine Studio in May. That's the last two weekend, week, last two Tuesdays in May. Awesome. And Nick. Nick Marie, uh, wine calm guy. So winecalmguy.com. Find me on Twitter, on Instagram. I'm going to be starting writing again. Coloma has me pretty much like pinned down. Um, but I'm going to try to get back to my writing. And I also do cellar planning, event planning if you're looking for wines. And so that's what I do. Oh. Very cool. And then if you're ever in the Willamette Valley, you can hit me up. I'm Lori. This weekend, Friday, I am doing an event at a country club here in Jersey. Hopefully, we'll. People will enjoy our Cap Franc and our Rosé, which is not a Sagné. It is a true Rosé of Syrah. And we um, Saturday I get to spend the entire day back at work because uh, it's lacrosse day. And I am spending the day doing the clock for every game of lacrosse during the day. So that's my exciting weekend. But Friday will be good. I want to thank everybody for being here. And I appreciate you taking your time. 
And next month, I will be sending you guys another doodle soon. Thanks to Debbie teaching me what a doodle is. Um, <laughs> I hope he said... Welcome to 1998. Never even heard of it before. I was like, whoa! Um, anyway, so next month is the actual week would be Memorial Day weekend. So I'm actually moving it up uh, to May 14th. Right, Debbie? Not Wife of Beth Street, is it? No. The okay. Wife of Beth Street is the weekend after. Weekend okay. after. Okay. So May 14th, again at 8 p.m. And we are going to be discussing points versus palette. What's more Ooh. important to you? So, oh. Right. Wow. No controversy that's, there. That's no cool. controversy whatsoever. There's two questions there. So I hope you guys that's all can fun. join in. We will have a good, uh, everybody have a great month. And we'll see you on social right. media. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Good night. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good did you know that Dracina Wines now has a wine club? We named it the Chalk Club. Draco is on our label, but Vegas was getting a little jealous, so we decided he deserved to be our club spokes dog. In Las Vegas, betting chalk means that you are betting on all of the favorites. We are betting that we are one of your favorite wineries, so we thought the name was apropos. The club is simple, yet a bit different than most. When you wager on us, we will ship you three bottles of wine twice a year, once in April and once in September. You can choose all red or mix of red and rosé. You immediately receive 15% off of all your wine purchases throughout the year, but what makes our club stand out is the progressive discount. Let your club membership ride into the next year. Your discount increases. Each year you parlay your membership, you receive an additional 5% off up to a planned maximum of 25%. Your club shipments are discounted to a flat $15, plus we'll cover your club shipping cost for your second shipment. That's $15 house money in a sure bet for you. So please head to our website, dracinawines.com, and find out all of the benefits of joining the Chalk Club and how to sign up. We've stacked the odds so that you can get our award-winning wines without breaking the bank. Thanks for listening to Dracina Wines Podcast. If you have suggestions on what topics you would like us to discuss, please reach out to us on social media. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, Facebook, Snapchat, Google, and Periscope as at Dracina Wines. I am also on LinkedIn as Lori Hoyt Bud, or email us at dracinawines.com. If you enjoyed our podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast catcher to help others find us more easily. We are found on all of your favorite aggregators. To subscribe easily to iTunes, go to bit.ly forward slash Dracina podcast. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Dracina podcast. And that's a capital D for Dracina and capital P for podcast. Please check out our award-winning wines and find out about our wine club at dracinawines.com. And remember to always pursue your passion. Slancha.